It is uh, really wonderful that we have a guest that in this building is beloved for your books as well as for your willingness to come and talk with us. So, please join me in welcoming Yuval you. to the IMF. Thank you. So, uh, I'm Yuval Noah Harari. I'm a historian and philosopher. I teach at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a fellow at the University of Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. I'm the author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and I've just now published my new book, Nexus, A Brief History of Information Networks from the Stone Age to AI. So Professor Harari was invited by IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva to share his ideas with fund economists about the impact of AI and information networks on the global economy. So I had the privilege of sitting down with Yuval Noah Harari for this episode of the podcast. But first, let's go back to the event for a minute and let the Managing Director start us off. So uh, I want to ask you how would you describe the main message of your book? And uh, what can you tell us about the uh, problems we have in how we naively interpret information as if it is always a source for good? Mm. So there are two main messages, I think. The first very general, almost philosophical message Mm. is that information isn't truth. Mm Most information is uh, a fiction and fantasy and delusion. The truth is a very small subset of information. The truth is costly. Mm. You need to do research. You need to gather evidence. You need to invest time, effort, money in producing the truth. Secondly, the truth tends to be complicated because reality is complicated. You know, explaining an economic crisis, you know, it's complicated because the reality of the economy, of politics is complicated. And finally, the truth is often painful. The other key message is that we are in the process of unleashing on the world the most powerful, not just information technology, the most powerful technology we have ever created, AI. Uh, AI is fundamentally different from printing presses, from atom bombs, from everything we've in- invented so far. It's the first technology in history that can make decisions by itself and can create new ideas by itself. An atom bomb could not decide who to bomb, AI can. And the AI that we are familiar with today in 2024 is just a very, very, very primitive first steps of the AI revolution. We haven't seen anything yet. So um, one of the basic principles that you build this history of sapiens on is our ability to imagine things. Hmm. and how that sort of sets us apart from other species. Um, How did our storytelling prowess allow us to prevail over, you know, much bigger and stronger creatures that were evolving alongside us? No, basically our power is cooperation. Uh, Whereas chimpanzees, for instance, can cooperate only in very small numbers, maybe 20, 80 chimpanzees can cooperate. Homo sapiens can cooperate in unlimited numbers. If you look at the world today, you have 8 billion people that despite many differences and despite many conflicts, at least in some areas like the economy, almost all of them are part of the same trade networks so that the food we eat, the clothes we wear, uh, the energy we consume, it often comes from the other side of the world. And this is our superpower, these large networks of cooperation. And cooperation is based on trust. Trust is the most important resource in the world, more important than uh, oil or gold or data or anything else. And how do you build trust between strangers? Uh, The answer is stories. We build trust by inventing stories that many people believe. And this is obviously true in the case of religions, but it's also true in the case of the economy and the financial system. Corporations and money 
are some of the most successful stories ever invented by human beings. And, you know, when I look at the history of finance, I, I am amazed by the creativity of human beings. You know, when people think about creativity, they think about poetry, about painting, about architecture, but inventing a new financial device is also an extremely creative thing. And, you know, all financial devices, what they do is simply build trust. You know, if you ask, what do bankers do in life? Bankers build trust uh, that, you know, Uh, my resources are put in the service of some huge project with millions of other people around the world. This is what banking is all about. Mm. So uh, it's through these stories that we've managed to sort of expand our natural circles uh, of family and local communities uh, into these uh, imagined communities. Yes. Um, so Imagined in, in the sense that, again, most of the other people in your nation... or in your religion, or in your corporation, if it's a big corporation, mm -hmm. you don't know them. Uh, nevertheless, you trust them to some mm. extent uh, so that you can cooperate with them. So, And it's, it's easiest to understand in, in the case of religions mm -hmm. that millions of people can cooperate, whether on, on, on you know, charitable uh, enterprises like building hospitals or on waging a holy war, because mm. all these millions of strangers, they believe in the same mythology. But the same thing is happening in the economic sphere, uh, because again, the most successful story ever told is the story of money, because it's basically the only story that everybody believes in. And when I say that money is, is, is a story, is, is a fiction, um, it's, uh, you know, it has no objective value. Even the old type of, of currencies like banknotes and, and, and coins, they have no objective value. You can't eat them, you can't drink them. But if you believe the stories told about these pieces of paper and metal, like that this piece of paper is worth a, a piece of bread, then you can go to a complete stranger you never met in your life, give him or her this worthless piece of paper, and in exchange get bread that you can actually eat. Uh, and it, it is all based on everybody believing the same stories about money. Mm. And you see it most clearly when it fails. when people stop believing in the story. And we saw these examples throughout history that suddenly people lose trust in the money mm. and everything collapses. And we see it also today, you know, with the rise of new types of, of currencies, of money. If you think about Bitcoin or Ethereum and all these cryptocurrencies, what are they? They are stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, their value depend on the stories that people tell about them and believe about them. And you see that the, the rise and fall of people's trust in the story in the rise and fall of the value of the Bitcoin. So, so in fact, the, the concept of money or money itself is nothing but a cultural artifact. Yes. Uh, I mean, but but in, in your latest book, Nexus, you say that um, data... is behind or what will drive the economies of the future, mm -hmm. will it be easier to determine the intrinsic value of data than it is mm -hmm. money? And, you know, what does that mean for uh, financial stability, which is the main focus of this institution? Well, we are in an extremely uh, volatile period mm -hmm. in history when you see collapse of trust in so many institutions in so many of the old stories that hold society together. Money is one of the last stories that uh, still holds. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, for instance, at, at US society, so Republicans and Democrats cannot agree on almost anything. They can't agree on the most basic facts. Almost the only story that still connects them is money because they still believe, both sides still believe in the dollar. And both sides still believe in the same prices. It's the same price of gasoline for Democrats and for Republicans. It's almost, again, the, almost the last thing <laughs> they share. Just imagine what would happen if each side would have a different monetary system, which is already happening to some extent with the rise of cryptocurrencies and alternative methods of payment. So what would happen if, if you have a, a kind of Republican currency and democratic currency? But something even deeper is happening, which calls into question the whole uh, idea of money. We see the rise of information economy, which is based on the exchange of information and not on the exchange of, of currencies. 
to, to give, start with an example, one of the most important corporations in my life is Google. I use it every day throughout the day. Numerous transactions I have with Google every day. But if you look at my bank account, you will never know that because no money is changing hands. I don't pay Google anything in money and Google doesn't give me money. Uh, I get from Google information. And Google gets information from you as you're... Yes. So doing your searches. Exactly. I'm doing searches. I get information from Google and Google gets a lot of information from me about my likes, my dislikes, my opinions, whatever. And then it uses this information. And what we see is that increasingly more and more transactions in the world follow this format of information in exchange for information and not something in exchange for money. And uh, you see that Power, wealth, uh, the meaning of wealth uh, shifts from having a lot of dollars to having a lot of petabytes of information. What happens if the wealthiest, most powerful people, corporations in a country are wealthy in the sense that they have huge stores of information that they don't even bother to uh, monetize, to exchange for money, because they can get anything they want in exchange for information. Mm. And after, why do we need money? Because we use money to buy different services and goods. But if you can buy the services and goods for information, not for money, mm. then you don't need money. And we are seeing this shift. I mean, we, we, it's, it's still far from complete, of course, yeah. but we are in the midst of this transition from a money economy to an information economy, which raises a lot of, of deep questions about the nature of the financial system and about things like taxation. You know, countries cannot exist without taxes. Now, governments have thousands of years of experience in taxing money. They have no experience in taxing information. And if, if the wealthiest, most powerful entity in your country is wealthy in information and you don't know how to tax information, so the basic idea of taxation, of redistribution, taking from the richest members of society in order to benefit everybody, including the poorest members of society, if you don't know how to do it in terms of information, then the whole taxation system is, is skewed. It, it, it doesn't really understand the reality of wealth and power in the country. You know, it's almost a philosophical question about the, this relationship, what is money and how it relates to information. And the old kind of uh, uh, consensus that in the end you can measure the value of everything in the world with money, what happens if this is no longer true? that money becomes this token that you use only in certain specific areas of life, but much of what is happening in the world is just not monetized. It, it functions according to a different logic. So I'd like to step back just uh, for a minute uh, and go back to the early stages of our evolution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we talk about sustainability a lot these days and how economies are putting pressure on our natural world. And in your book, Sapiens, um, you say that, you know, the big turning point for civilization was really the agricultural revolution, where we, you know, went from uh, surviving from our natural environment to trying to control it. Yeah. And, and you describe that as being uh, essentially the, the beginning of the end for any kind of form of, of uh, sustainable uh, yeah. development or a sustainable existence. What is the... the uh, legacy of the agricultural revolution, do you think, in terms of how our economies are built today and how we work? Hmm. First of all, the, the, the agricultural revolution was about control, about first humans learning how to control animals and plants, which previously were wild. I mean, people ate sheep and they ate wheat even before the agricultural revolution, but they had no control of it. The wheat grew wild in the, on the hills of, of the Middle East, and people didn't tell it where to grow. And agriculture is simply when people start having control of, of these other entities, animals and plants. And then, of course, people start having control of other people. 
because this is all, it didn't end with having control of the wheat and of the cows. Very quickly, it became, became having control of other people. And you see the rise of slavery. And you see the rise of these centralized authoritarian regimes that use coercion and also use information in order to control thousands and then millions and, and tens of millions of people. And these systems of control, on the one hand, they produce enormous resources and wealth compared to what was available to humanity previously. But... Two negative sides is that the life of most people don't become better. Mm. Uh, what happens is simply that you have a lot more people. I mean, you have a lot more food, but it doesn't mean that each individual eats better. Actually, each individual eats worse, but you simply have a lot more individuals, a lot more humans. So the, the, the people at the top, the kings, the high priests, the emperors, they live much better. But if you're an average peasant in ancient Egypt or ancient China, your life is actually much harder than the life of hunter-gatherers before the agricultural revolution. The other thing that happened is that uh, sustainability goes down. As people start manipulating the ecological system, it goes out of balance and you see repeated disasters. Long before industry, long before the 20th century, you see waves of uh, extinction of animals and plants, destruction of habitats that then goes back to, to bite the humans in the form of repeated waves of famine and uh, disease. Uh, something most people don't know, but very relevant, you know, in the aftermath of COVID, is that epidemics began with agriculture. Hunter-gatherers did not suffer from epidemics. Only when people start uh, having agriculture and building towns and cities and, and dense trade networks, then you have suddenly paradise for germs. So there are outbreaks of disease and this spreads and you have epidemics. So agriculture that was supposed to be this wonderful thing for, for, for human, it was wonderful for germs. And it started the, 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 the great waves of epidemics that still afflict us today. Mm. And, you know, this is a big lesson for the current technological revolution of, of AI, that um, the intentions are good. The intentions are also good with the invention of agriculture. There are always unintended consequences. When people domesticated wheat, they thought they will have more food and better lives. They, in exchange, they actually got slavery and epidemics. So with AI, we think the people who develop it, that it will do good to humanity, there are going to be lots of unintended consequences. Mm. So agriculture started us thinking about science and technology, mm. and science and technology have essentially t taken over our evolution at this point. Yeah, but by uh, now, definitely. Wh yeah. Which is the topic of, of Nexus, your, mm -hmm. your latest book, um, and where you build on this idea uh, that uh, stories and, and sharing these common myths uh, are being harnessed to, to gain power, mm -hmm. and how those stories spread like viruses, uh, as you describe in Sapiens, um, you know, early on, but now how they spread through these uh, super sophisticated information networks. Yeah. So, so what happens essentially when, when uh, you know, technology in the form of artificial intelligence not only creates these stories, but disseminates them yeah. to, to the degree that it, it has. What happens? Uh, we have an earthquake. Uh, you know, uh, in, in human societies are, are based on trust. Trust is based on information, on communication. You need to communicate with other people to trust them. And when there is a major change in the communication technology, it destabilizes the the trust between people and the result is a social and political earthquake that we now again we are now in a paradoxical situation when we have the most sophisticated information technology in human history and people can't talk to each other mm. and people don't trust each other you see this crisis of trust all over the world and it's especially dangerous to democratic systems, which are really based on trust. Dictatorships can survive because dictatorships, uh, they rely on terror 
far more than on trust. If you destroy trust in all the institutions, you are leading humanity straight to dictatorship, which is the only system that can survive without trust. Again, because it, it's based on terror. And what we see with the rise of, of AI is that for the first time, the stories that sustain human societies are generated by a non-human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this can be religious stories and this can be financial stories. So all previous financial devices in history for money and, and checks and, and credit and ETFs and CDOs and all these more and more complicated financial devices, they were all emerged from the human imagination. And now we will start seeing financial devices invented by AIs, which has a, a big potential danger that AIs could invent financial devices that no human being is capable of understanding and therefore nobody can regulate. And we saw in 2008 what happens when humans invent a new financial device which is not regulated properly because it, it was too complicated for the regulators. And we can now, like in five years or 10 years, have the biggest financial crisis in history and no human understands what is happening because the new financial devices are beyond the, the human capacity, beyond the human brain. So the AIs are beginning to invent the stories. They are also taking control of disseminating the stories. You know, it's often easy to create stories. It's very difficult to gain the attention of people. That's right. Because there are so many competing stories. If you think about, again, religion, politics, so many competing stories. So the real power is not the power to invent a story. That's easy. The real power is to grab the attention of people and make sure that they focus on this story and not on one of the thousands of alternatives. Now, traditionally, this was, again, a human job. Yeah. Like the, this is, for instance, what editors of newspapers do. And now this job is increasingly done by algorithms yeah. because the most powerful media platforms today are no longer the old-fashioned newspapers or, or, or TV stations. They are social media. And on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, uh, Twitter, who determines what will be, what you will see in your news feed and what will be the main story? It's algorithms. So we are already in a situation when maybe the most important job in our information network has, has been taken over by a non-human intelligence. So uh, artificial intelligence or AI uh, making decisions for us humans uh, without any oversight is dangerous, uh, as you have just laid out. Mm -hmm. But sapiens, uh, as you've also made very clear in your other writings, have run roughshod over the planet with mm. impunity, like, uh, and I, I quote again uh, from Sapiens, like gods who don't know what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so is there something that economics uh, can offer to sort of help soften the impact when these two forces uh, collide at some point, if they haven't already? Well, economics, in my view, is all about priorities. I mean, setting the priorities. You have a limited amount of resources. You have so many different desires and needs. What are the priorities? Like you make a budget. <laughs> this is the question. How much money for defense? How much money for healthcare? How much money for education? You run a corporation, same, same questions. So economics is about shaping priorities. And when you shape priorities, there are two key questions. What is the truth? What are the facts? And secondly, what do we want? What are the desires? There is the truth question and there is the desire question. Now, when it comes to the desire question, the best system that we have managed to come up so far is democracy. That you ask people, what do you want? Yeah. And the desires of, uh, you know, somebody with a PhD in economics or Nobel Prize in economics are not more important than the desires of somebody who did not even finish uh, high school. Mm -hmm. On the level of desire, we are all equal. And the democratic system 
uh, the, the aim is to give equal weight to everyone's desires. Yeah. On the other hand, the question of truth, what are the facts? Democracy is not an ideal system hmm. for deciding what is the truth. If you want, for instance, to know whether uh, the Earth climate is really heating up and whether this is a consequence of human action or of some natural cycle of the sun or whatever, this should not be a question for elections, for democratic elections. This is a question of truth, mm -hmm. not a question of desire. One thing we know about humans, we've learned over thousands of years, is that people often desire the truth to be different from what it is. For personal reasons, for religious reasons, for ideological reasons. I mean, you don't, it, it's not a good idea to decide whether humans evolved from apes by having a democratic election about it. This is, uh, the, this is the, the job of experts in biology, in evolution, who studied for years and years how to find and analyze the evidence. And it's the same with the climate, and it's the same with epidemics. If you want to know the facts, you need to build institutions of experts who train men in many years in, in order to understand how to analyze the evidence. Mm. And there should be a balanced relationship between these two. Uh, the experts should tell us the facts, but should not dictate our desires, should not tell us what to do. So, you know, you have experts telling us, yes, climate change is real. This is the causes. Then the ball goes to the democratic playground. And, you know, if most people decide that they don't care about future generations, they want to uh, uh, spend as much energy now. And if in 50 years this causes disaster, this is what we want. So, in, in a democracy, if this is what people want, these are, these are their desires. What they shouldn't have is the ability to deny the facts. That you shouldn't be able to vote on a, a law that says that climate change isn't real. Mm. But the, those democratic decisions, people make those decisions based on the stories that they hear. Mm. And therefore, you know, AI in, in helping form those stories and, and disseminate them, um, this will ultimately have a big impact on how people think about certain... Absolutely. Again, and, and again, this, this, if, for instance, there is a conspiracy theory that climate change isn't real, mm -hmm. that it's some kind of conspiracy of powerful in, individuals or organizations to control the world or to make lots of money or whatever, and you have, I don't know, the Twitter algorithm pushing this conspiracy yeah. to the top of the news feed, and you have YouTube recommending to people to see these videos, then this is a very dangerous situation. Uh, it's extremely dangerous, you know, if these key decisions are actually taken by not by human beings at all. Right. So at this point, I'm going to take us back to your talk before a group of economists at the IMF and let the managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, ask the last question. So what is your advice to us here at the IMF? What should we do? <laughs> um, two things. Don't let we have thousands of years of experience with human beings we don't have similar experiences with ai's human beings have their weaknesses but at least we know what they are mm. so don't let the financial system get completely out of human control it as tempting as it may sound to give more and more power and authority to ai's should be very extremely important to keep humans in the financial loop. We have this discussion a lot in the military sphere mm -hmm. with all these autonomous weapon systems. There the discussion is, is very kind of advanced uh, and people are not necessarily making the right decisions. But at least everybody understands it's a very, very big issue. It should, we should have this discussion also about the financial system. And the other thing we need is an institution we can trust which can tell us the facts, because people often want the facts to be different from what they are. Um, I want to quote something um, uh, you say in the book about us humans. If we are so wise, why are we so self-destructive? 
the, you know, the, the answer we get from a lot of mythology and, and, and theologies is that there is something wrong in human nature. And the answer that I give in, in Nexus in the book is that the problem is not in human nature, the problem is in our information. If you give good people bad information, they make bad decisions. Mm. And then the question becomes, so why are we flooded by bad information? And this is what really the book tries to answer right. this question. Why is it that we are flooded by bad information? So it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. We will probably, none of us will be around to, to really see the effects of all this. Oh, we will be. I, hope, I mean, it's, we're talking about five, ten years hmm. until, you know, you have this explosion of, of AI. Wow. It's not centuries in the future. It's really a matter of a few years or a few decades at most. Yuval Noah Harari, uh, author of uh, Sapiens and several other books, uh, the latest being Nexus, um, a brief history of information networks from the Stone Age to AI. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Aside from being a best-selling author, Yuval Noah Harari is a lecturer at the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a distinguished research fellow at the University of Cambridge's Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Go to ynharari.com to find out more about his research and his books. And you can also find more of these IMF podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on X. Our handle is at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Thanks for listening.